Awesome. So again, I want to send a special thank you to Ali, uh, Jamie with uh, Oregon Wild, Oregon Wild in general, and our partners over there for all the work that they do in conservation um, and being our, our partners on certain things such as uh, the River Democracy Act and, and all the work that um, is going towards that, um, towards Senator Wyden's awesome legislation to protect our rivers and streams. So thank you, Oregon Wild, for putting this on tonight. And i um, super excited to be here and share about um, something that's pretty near and dear to my heart. And I'm passionate about both uh, wild native fish as well as um, rivers. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with a little bit of an intro to what Native Fish Society is um, and who we are. Um, Native Fish Society was founded in uh, was founded in Portland in 1995 by a small group of passionate anglers and advocates. Uh, since then, we've grown into one of the leading grassroots nonprofit Native Fish conservation organizations in the Pacific Northwest. We work from the Russian River in Northern California, across the states of Washington and Oregon and Western Idaho, and partners in British Columbia. So we extend all the way up into Canada. Um, we serve nearly 4,000 members and supporters, and 80% of our funding comes from individuals. We are a grassroots-led and grassroots-funded organization. Um, as you can see here, uh, our mission is to restore and protect abundant wild runs of native fish and to steward the rivers and watersheds that sustain them all. Our ultimate vision is wild fish for all. Uh, Native Fish Society exists to cultivate a groundswell of public support necessary to revive abundant wild fish, free flowing rivers and thriving local communities. We look at the uh, entire watershed as, as an eco ecosystem as a whole, rather than just the fishery itself um, and just focusing on the native fish that, that call those waters home. We, we focus on the communities, um, the people, and um, everything that surrounds it. A section of our, our, our organization is um, our River Steward Program. It's a, a network of place-based advocates for wild fish. These are place-based local advocates on each individual watershed throughout the Pacific Northwest that call them their home waters. Um, we have 88 different river stewards located throughout the Pacific Northwest doing this and protecting their home waters on over 4,000 river miles. We have 174,000 square miles of watersheds in four different states. Um, pictured here, you can see our awesome South Umpqua River steward, Stan Petrowski. Um, Stan's been engaged with us for, for multiple years now, and he calls the South Umpqua his home. He lives nearby off of Joe Hall Creek. The efforts of our staff and volunteers and members converge in, a specific, conser in specific conservation campaigns, which we advance um, for the conservation of native fish by targeting specific challenges or opportunities and leveraging grassroots organizing and solutions based on science and ecological knowledge. Um, typically, we focus campaigns on one or more of the root causes of wild fish decline. We often refer to these as the five H's. Um, on this slide, you can only see four, but we focus on five H's. Um, the first one being habitat um, and what they call home. The second being hydropower or barriers, dams to fish. Uh, the third being hatcheries. The fourth being harvest, both uh, a little bit commercially and uh, sport harvest within our fisheries. And then lastly, we focus on heat, which isn't pictured here. Heat and climate change are one of the most um, influential limiting factors to our fisheries today. Um, so it's important that we, we include this in our package of of what we're focusing our conservation campaigns on now and into the future. Another section of our organizational uh, structure is our Native Fish Fellowship Program. Um, Native, Native Fish Fellows are grassroots network of exceptional experts who donate their unique skills and talents to advance our strategic conservation efforts. Um, today, we have 14 different fellows with diverse backgrounds, including economists, underwater photographers, big data analysis, 
and other experts that help provide leverage that we can utilize in our campaigns across the Pacific Northwest. Um, these are awesome volunteers that have outstanding expertise in these fields. We hook them up with our local river stewards to, to really engage in different campaigns. Today, Native Fish Society has 34 active conservation campaigns across the Pacific Northwest. Um, you can see the map here. Um, we have all 34 of these are focusing on different, uh, different H's throughout the Pacific Northwest. And you can see those indicated by the numbers and where they're at. Um, we have multiple in California. Oregon, where we started, is obviously heavily influenced with campaigns. And then Washington, one up in British Columbia, and all the way over to Idaho. Um, these are these are all the work that we have going on right now. And they range from all five of those H's that we spoke about in the last couple slides. So with that, I want to transition into the reason we're here tonight and fly fishing the wild and scenic rivers of Oregon. Um, it, I, I also want to continue to send thanks out to, to Jamie and to Allie to have me here tonight and share something that I'm so passionate about, um, fly fishing. Um, I want to share a little bit of my, about my background in fly fishing and how, how I got to where I am today. Um, I started fly fishing at a young age, um, shortly after school. I realized it was a real passion. Um, I guided some of the, the rivers in Colorado high country um, shortly after college and then moved my way out to the Pacific Northwest to call Oregon home about four years ago. Um, what I'm speaking to you about tonight will transition across multiple different watersheds. Unfortunately, we only have an hour here tonight and my presentation is about 40 minutes long. So. Um, I'm only focusing on three different watersheds um, or areas, regions within our, our state. I'm going to focus on the Sprague, the North Umpqua, um, and then lastly, the Wild Rivers Coast and the, the streams down in the southwest Oregon. Um, again, a lot of the tips and tactics, strategies that I share with you here tonight will be transition, can be transitioned to other streams throughout our state, throughout the west, and utilized for trout fishing or steelhead fishing, whatever you might be in, um, interested in, in engaging with. The other thing I wanted to bring up about the presentation tonight um, is the River Democracy Act um, focuses uh, why we, I want to first of all send thanks to Wyden and Merkley for introducing that but included in the River Democracy Act legislation is a lot of protections for small tributaries and streams that provide um, essential water to these bigger watersheds that we fish and that we call our home waters. Um, without protecting and providing conservation measures for these real small streams, um, we wouldn't have the water quality quantity for our communities further downstream, and we wouldn't have the fisheries further downstream. So it's critical that we protect these watersheds long into the future for future generations to utilize and enjoy um, because these fish use those smaller tributaries. Yeah, we might not be able to fish them, um, but they use them for spawning, rearing, um, and the cold water that they they provide to our our major river systems. So, with that, I'm going to co continue into my presentation. This here is a photo of me fly fishing and swinging uh, flies on the the North Umpqua for winter steelhead. Uh, the North Umpqua was designated wild and scenic in 1988, and that's for 35 four miles downstream from Soda Springs Dam. Beautiful section of river if you haven't been to it yet. I'm going to jump into that a little further in my presentation here. So this, I want, like I said before, I want to wanted to start my presentation in the Sprague River in the Upper Klamath Basin. Um, it's a very diverse river with multiple different species calling it home. Um, provides adequate clean water for for these species, the entomology, the entire ecosystem that's up there. The photos here you can see are of the Sprague up in the upper left-hand corner, um, an alluvial red band rainbow, and a uh, bull trout, which I'll call it home. The Sprague has three species of lamprey, one of which is um, undescribed, and the others are only found in the Klamath system. Two species of sculpin are only found in the Klamath Basin, and they call the Sprague home. 
and three species of uh, suckers that call the spray comb, two of only which are in the upper Klamath Basin. And a high, um, high concentration of inland red band trout. Uh, recently, there has been genetic analysis that suggests the, the migratory red bands that spawn in the Sprague River, also the Wood and Williamson River, um, are um, a distinct ancient race of trout only found in the upper Klamath River Basin. Um, these fish are very unique um, and deserve quite the protections that we, that we um, need to provide for them. Um, and uh, the River Democracy Act will help with that. Um, I wanna thank Jordan Ortega for these pictures. Jordan is a PhD student with OSU Fisheries that uh, is studying these fish in the Klamath Basin and the Sprague itself and doing a lot of work up there. The other fish that I wanna point out that's not native, you can see it at the bottom of the list here is brook trout. Um, they're invasive to the watershed and actually are part of a limiting factor to the native red bands, um, the lamprey and other species that call it home. So whenever we're out there fishing for these, uh, these brook trout, um, they're actually really thriving in the watershed. So um, don't be bashful about taking a few home for dinner or enjoying those at home. So including the River Democracy Act um, is the South Fork of the Sprague River. Um, like I said earlier, they have native bull trout located in the system. Um, it is a spring driven throughout the summer. So it loses all its uh, snow melt. It starts on the headwaters. The headwaters of the South Fork of the Sprague are Deer Heart Mountain, um, which, which does get quite a bit of snowpack. But once that snowpack dwindles, um, it transitions to a fully spring-driven um, watershed, and that water stays extremely cool that's beneficial to those, uh, those native trout species that call it home and other species that call it home um, long into the late summer months, especially in years like we're, we're, uh, we're seeing here today. The North Fork of the Sprague River, um, it travels through a beautiful canyon. Um, again, its headwaters are on Gearheart Mountain and it's spring fed through the late summer months. Um, here's a couple beautiful pictures that Jordan provided me as well uh, of that watershed and fishing out on it. Here's a picture of the main stem of the Sprague. Uh, again, these aren't included in the River Democracy Act, but um, it's going to see huge benefits from the protections that the river Democracy Act provides to it. Um, both the South Fork and the North Fork of the Sprague are included in the River Democracy Act, which we will get into here in a little bit. I wanted to cover a little bit about the entomology. Um, so the entomology is the bugs that call, bugs or the food and um, whatnot that calls it home. Um, so I wanted to, the, the Sprague River is um, famous for a hexagenia hatch, which is a large looking mayfly. You can see it on the right picture there. Um, see how big it is compared to Jordan's fingers there. Um, quite big. Um, it's very unique. Um, in some watersheds, they don't have a hex hatch. They also have abundant leeches, which the, the fish thrive off of. They have black drakes, caddis, and other mayflies and dragonfly larvae, which are beneficial to the ecosystem. I want to share a little bit about the gear that might be useful when fly fishing the um, North Fork or South Fork Sprague and the main stem of the Sprague River. Um, for me, um, again, this these are all recommendations from what I know and what I like to do. This can easily be transformed for anyone's um, liking. Um, some folks might like something a little bit different, but for me, I really enjoy a nine foot four weight rod. Um, it's ideal for a smaller watershed. You still have enough power to fight bigger fish, yet um, it's fun to catch those bigger fish and you can get the line out there. For the main, spin of the, main stem of the Sprague River, I would suggest a five weight, um, a little bit heavier, a little bit more backbone for those fish. Um, as for flies, um, I would focus directly, um, especially after the summer months, um, I would focus into the um, terrestrials. So hoppers, grasshoppers, ants, and beetles. 
other months of the year, um, in, including in the summertime, um, mayflies would work really well. Caddis would work very well. Um, usually on, on many of the streams, uh, focus on a, a caddis hatch around Mother's Day. So um, this would work well as well. Small nymphs, including a pheasant tail, um, which imitates a mayfly and small woolly boogers or wet flies that are very tiny. They imitate a leech um, and those would work really well. Um, soft stripping, similar to what a leech would look like floating down through the river. So um, the top left picture is a picture of kind of the gear that I take out. I'm gonna share in the next slide about what that is and where it goes. Um, and the top right picture is a picture of the nymphs that I would utilize in the Sprague River. You can see the pheasant tail on the bo bottom right, a um, couple other different patterns, um, some small stone flies, that sort of thing. And then the terrestrial box um, straight ahead, um, ants, beetles, um, large chubby Chernobyls um, and grasshopper looking patterns. Um, stimulators would work very well too. Um, not pictured here are caddis or some parachute atoms or atoms flies that might work really well as well. So for a setup, um, and when I say setup, I mean like my line and how I'm going to rig my rod to go out there and fish the Sprague River. Um, I would use a, a four weight rod, like I said earlier, um, and I would use a four weight line that's, that's rated for that. Attach that line to your backing, which is on your reel. Any fly shop can help you rig that up. Um, I would use it a seven and a half foot tapo, tapered mono leader. Um, the reason I would use a seven and a half foot rather than a nine foot would be the size of the stream is a little bit smaller than what um, I would need for a nine foot tapered leader. So um, if I were, if it were necessary, I could add some tippet onto the end of that, make it, make my presentation a little longer. The only reason I would be doing that is if, if the trout are spooky, I notice I'm spooking quite a few fish. I also take tippet. Um, you can see the tippet spool that's out there. Um, I take multiple different types of tippet just in case um, some of them are fluorocarbon, some are monofilament. But really, if you limit yourself to 4X and 5X tippet on the, the Sprague River, you'll be totally fine. Mo spools of mono, um, you'll be able to throw both um, dry flies and um, underneath the surface with, with some nymphs, and you should be able to handle those fish just right. Um, I would start off by fishing a dry fly on the surface um, and fish the small pockets of holding water one to three feet deep. Fish will hold in faster water during hot water temps. Um, so really focus on the faster water when the water temps are up um, and try small uh, seams and edges of the riffles and look under grassy banks for larger fish during hopper season. That's a good thing. One thing to keep in mind, and, and I'll continue to share about this throughout my presentation, is, is it's important to carry a uh, thermometer with you when you're out there in the field. Um, as soon as water temperatures reach 68 degrees, it's, it's very stressful for those fish. Um, so it's best to call it quits when those water temps get above 68, um, even when they're at 68, 67, anything over 65. Um, it's super stressful for both trout and steelhead. So it's most likely a uh, decision to make it, hang it up, maybe go swimming, snorkeling, look at those fish and observe them from a distance rather than, than actually catching them. I wanted to share some of the threats to the Sprague watershed. So um, overgrazing within the upper watershed um, has been an issue. Um, irrigation further down and then invasive species or those brook trout. These pictures here, you can see the uh, North Fork of the Sprague and uh, a lovely couple enjoying the day out fishing. These are courtesy of Marshall Mo Mosier, our river steward over in the Klamath Basin. So the protections under the River Democracy Act, the South Fork of the Sprague, um, we'll see 25.6 miles proposed for wild and scenic, has been proposed for wild and scenic designation. The North Fork of the Sprague has seen 9.1 miles proposed for wild and scenic. The land managers will create a comprehensive management river management plan for the proposed area. It will not affect private property further down. This is only for federal lands and it will benefit the water quality and the ecosystem further downstream on the main stem of the, the Sprague River in private land access. So 
beautiful river. If you've never been over to central, um, central Oregon, south central Oregon, um, east of the Cascades, check it out. Beautiful watershed. Um, there's also the Williamson um, and the uh, Sycan rivers over there as well that also fish well. So it's a great little destination area to, where you can hit a couple of different streams and catch quite a few different trout. One thing I would mention, this area did see anadromous fish back in the day. However, with the building of the dams, the four lower Klamath River dams, volitional fish passage was blocked. So we are looking at getting those dams removed in 2023, which quite possibly could bring back steelhead and both spring chinook to this basin, which would be very exciting and is a wonderful opportunity for this watershed. The next section of my uh, presentation, I wanted to discuss and share with you all about fishing on the Wild Rivers Coast. So the Wild Rivers Coast is the section of southwestern Oregon on the coast that um, beautiful area. It goes from around Port, Port Orford area all the way down to the California border. Um, multiple different watersheds dumping into the ocean there, as well as the Lower Rogue entering um, the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the Lower Rogue has many tributaries as well that are highly beneficial, including the Illinois, which um, great little spot to, uh, to fish as well, which I won't cover too much of in this presentation. So the rivers of the Wild River Coast are uh, the Elk, the Lower Rogue River, Hunter Creek, Pistol River, Chetco, Winchuck, and Euchre Creek. These rivers are fairly unique. Um, they are unique. Uh, they have no dams uh, except for the Rogue River which their, its dam is up high, it's at Lost Creek Reservoir, um, and it's a stronghold for wild salmonids. So all these waters are highly beneficial. This picture here is of the Elk River um, over, over just outside of Port Orford. Um, Hunter Creek is part of the Wild Rivers Coast, and this is a beautiful picture of a wild uh, winter steelhead and some folks fishing Hunter Creek. Um, photos by Ken Morish. Pistol River, um, it's another area of the Wild Rivers Coast. Beautiful, beautiful photo here. Again, Ken Morish with the credit of fly water travel. The native fish of the Wild Rivers Coast. So like I said earlier, it's a wild fish stronghold um, with minimum hatchery influence. Um, it hosts a population of fall Chinook salmon winter steelhead, threatened coho salmon, sea run cutthroat trout, resident rainbow trout and Pacific lamprey. These photos here, juvenile, co or juvenile Chinook salmon, um, a juvenile steelhead in the top right corner, um, an adult steelhead there in the bottom left, and then um, some adult Chinook salmon there in the bottom. Again, these have fall Chinook, not spring Chinook. Uh, the Rogue River does have spring Chinook. So the lower Rogue, it does fish um, early in the spring. Um, those are spring Chinook. Here's some photos of some a beautiful coastal cutthroat trout. Um, they do host uh, great populations of coastal cutthroat trout and cutthroat trout fishing throughout the year. However, during this presentation for the Wild Rivers Coast, I'm going to focus mainly on winter steelhead. Um, but I did want to share with you that they do have so a uh, great population of coastal cutthroat trout. And then again, uh, a picture of a coastal lamprey down there. I'm gonna jump straight into the gear for winter steelhead fishing down there on the coast. Um, I would recommend a 13 foot seven weight spay rod um, and spay fishing down there. You could also use a 10 foot eight weight single handed rod. Um, for the spay rod, I would uh, recommend a Skagit line. It's a heavier set line, a little bit thicker, catches, you use the water tension to throw, throw your loops and cast the fly out rather than um, throwing the traditional cast that we've all seen on a river runs through it. Um, but it's a beautiful cast, easy way to fish. Um, some of those smaller, smaller rivers in the Wild Rivers Coast, um, definitely easily fishable with a single handed rod. Um, I would recommend a long belly taper line for that. The reason being is it's easy to roll cast and get that line out there. Uh, a roll cast allows you to cast with a single hand um, without having a back cast if you have bushes or whatnot behind you. When fishing for winter steelhead in this area, I would recommend um, you use tips to provide um, sink to the fly when necessary. 
Um, for a spay rod, I would recommend a 10 foot T11 uh, uh, tip for that. Um, and then tie your short leader onto that. Um, I'll cover the setup here in just a minute. But um, in this photo here, you can see a, uh, a winter steelhead fly. This is an intruder um, style pattern or an articulated style pattern, a Skagit line, and then two different uh, spay setups there that are ideal for fishing this area. A um, couple boxes of flies. Fairly simple to get out on the water. You will need waders for fishing for winter steelhead. As opposed to the sprague, I would highly recommend just wet wading on the sprague. Um, but for, for the Wild Rivers Coast, you would need waders and boots. Um, and as we all know, the coast rains a lot, so probably a rain jacket. Some flies that I would recommend for, for seagoing trout or anadromous trout or anadromous fish. Um, general practitioner is a large traditional style fly um, that works really well. Large hair wings. Um, winter fish typically like bigger flies. Um, they want something else to, to really instigate it. Uh, intruders, hobo spays. Um, first, Chinook. I put Clouser in there, and there's a picture of a Clouser there on the far right. Uh, they like Clousers, and um, Chinook are very difficult fish to catch. Um, once you um, get a little bit experienced with winter steelhead, I highly recommend getting out there and trying to catch a fall Chinook. Um, it's a great experience to get hooked up with one, and um, they're awesome fish, so um, get out there and try it out. Picture on the left is a hobo spay, um, and it's a wonderful fly to utilize on the Wild Rivers Coast. As for your setup, like I said, uh, a 12 foot seven weight rod would, is what I use. Um, it's a 12, six, seven weight rod. Um, I use a 550 grain Skagit head. Um, I use 12 feet of T11 sink tip. Um, and to that, so I, I take the Skagit line um, and I attach a, um, that 12 feet of T11 to that. And then um, to the end of that, I attach a two foot leader and, of 20 pound tippet and then a one foot leader of 15 pound tippet. Um, and then to that, I tie my fly on. This gives a great presentation to those fish um, and it instigates hopefully a bite. So when fly fishing for winter steelhead, I recommend using, like I said, large wet flies, some of those flies that I mentioned earlier. Um, use weighted flies in areas to get to the bottom. So if you're fishing in a little bit deeper area, um, definitely use a little bit of weight on that fly, including your weighted T11 sink tip. If you notice you're hitting bottom, lighten your fly, lighten your tip, um, make it a little bit easier so you're not hitting the bottom. Fish down and across to entice the fish. So it's um, your cast is standing from the bank and down and across at a 45 degree angle. And it's called swinging flies. Um, it's a traditional method that's utilized. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's definitely worth the commitment to try to catch a fish like that. Um, once you do, it really, it really sticks in and, and kind of um, gets you stuck with uh, fly fishing. Um, and find some nice holding water that is about walking pace. Um, so if, if you're slowly walking uh, in the winter time, that's the water you want to fish. If, if you can walk right next to the, the, the moving water. Um, during the summertime, summer I'll speak about summer fishing here in a minute, but you want to find a little bit faster water. But those fish are going to be in a little bit slower walking pace. Um, and as a last resort, you could use uh, an indicator with large nymphs. It works. It works actually extremely well, but um, I recommend trying to swing flies first. Um, but it is a way that you can catch fish and you can fish um, regular trouty looking water seams, edges of holding water for, for that. Fish will hold in front of rocks, behind rocks, and that sort of thing. Um, again, fly fishing for king salmon is, is a possibility, but very difficult. Um, and that's in the fall. Um, yeah. Pictured here is a beautiful, uh, beautiful fish caught on the Wild River Coast by uh, Ken Morish. Um, it's a beautiful wild winter steelhead, um, fly water travel. I wanted to share some of the threats to the Wild River Coast. Um, so mining is one of the biggest threats that they're seeing down there. Uh, currently there's a 20 year mineral withdrawal uh, on the area, but that's not permanent. Um, we're probably in year four of that. So um, 
there's been legislation introduced to um, make that permitted as well. Another threat is logging. Um, many of the watersheds when, when I go down there, private land has been logged and it's uh, only a matter of time that uh, the public land might be logged. So um, River Democracy Act will provide buffers on that. Um, some grazing up there, but uh, there's no dams. Like I said, Upper Rogue has lock, Lost Creek Reservoir. Protections under the River Democracy Act. So for Pistol River, 32.1 miles is being proposed. For Hunter Creek, 14.5 miles is being proposed under the legislation. For the Winchuck, 29 miles has been proposed. And then there's multiple tributaries to the Lower Rogue that have been included, including Shasta Costa Creek, um, Quisatna, um, and a couple others, as well as the tributaries to the Illinois. The Illinois is already wild and scenic, and so is parts of the Lower Rogue, but um, other tributaries to those rivers that are essential for our wild native fish, as well as the ecosystem around, are also included in the legislation for the River Democracy Act. Again, it'll provide one mile buffers for all streams that are included in the legislation. That's a half mile on either side of the river. Um, it will require land managers to develop that uh, management plan or the comprehensive river management plan that I, I spoke about on, in regards to the Sprague River. And it will include provisions for fire and it does not affect private lands. That's one thing to keep in mind. So after that, I wanted to transition to something that's even closer and near and dear and passionate to my heart, and that's the North Umpqua watershed. Um, I moved here a little over four years ago to the town of Roseburg, and I call the North Umpqua my home water. So it's a beautiful area, um, spent countless of hours out there swinging fish, swinging flies for uh, wild steelhead. Um, with this, pre this section of the presentation, I'm going to cover both the trout fishing as well as the steelhead fishing on the North Umpqua River. Um, it's just a gorgeous, abundant fish, abundant runs of fish. Um, we could always work on getting more, but um, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful fishery and it's something that I love, love so much. So some of the native fish of the Umpqua watershed include summer steelhead. Um, it is one of three rivers on the coast of Oregon that has a run of summer steelhead and it has one of the most, um, the best runs of summer steelhead. Uh, the winter steelhead of the North Umpqua, it has quite, quite a few too. Spring Chinook salmon call it home, threatened coho salmon, um, some fall Chinook make it up. Um, I don't have it on the list here, but um, there are a few that barely make it over. Uh, Winchester Dam, but they don't go far further up into the system. Um, sea run cutthroat trout, resident rainbow trout, Pacific lamprey, and brown trout are located in the system, but they're non-native. So if you are fishing for those and you catch a few, um, don't be bashful again, take those home and, and enjoy them. These pictures here are some, one, a winter, uh, they're all three winter steelhead of the North Umpqua River. Two of them have, were caught up in the fly only section. Um, one of them a little bit further down on the, the main stem of the North Umpqua River. I'm going to start off by fly fishing for trout in the North Umpqua and the main stem below Soda Springs Dam. So similar to the Sprague River, I would recommend a nine foot five weight rod. Um, weighted flies are illegal July 1 through October 1st. These are all regulations that are put aside for conservation measures for summer steelhead. Summer steelhead are a state sensitive species. So something to keep in mind. Um, I really recommend everyone checks the regulations on the North Umpqua before they go out. I'm sharing the typical things that I know, um, but I just wanted to share. No indicators or bobbers allowed while fishing. So nymph fishing um, is not possible uh, throughout the year. So um, summer or winter, a single barbless hook is only allowed. So no two flies or um, two, two, two hooks on the same fly. Some traditional Atlantic salmon flies have two flies, two hooks, but um, that's not allowed on the North Umpqua. Euronymphing is possible and uh, salmon flies are huge for trout fishing on the, uh, the North Umpqua in the months of May. Um, it's an awesome fishery and um, 
I would recommend waders for getting out there during this, during for trout fishing on the main stem of river. I would use, like I said, a, a typical rig that I used on the spray, the main stem spray. And um, we also have multiple different types of mayflies, uh, caddis flies coming off as well. But uh, again, that hatch that's awesome is the uh, salmon fly hatch. Pictured here are a couple different uh, photos of, uh, of trout on the North Umpqua, um, one angler down in the fly only section fishing for trout. And then the other one is a fish that I caught. I was spay fishing at this instance for summer steelhead. However, um, I landed this beautiful um, big cutthroat trout, um, which would have been easily uh, caught on a salmon fly pattern with a single handed rod had I been using that. So um, just an awesome fish there um, that, that lives there in the North Umpqua River. So I wanted to share a little bit about fly fishing above Soda Springs Dam. And this section is being proposed in the River Democracy Act as well. Um, it's dry fly fishing. You could also use a dry dropper. Um, there's lots of brown trout in this section, um, cutthroat trout as well, um, some rainbows. But the section is from, you can fish Lamolo Reservoir to Lamolo Falls, which has smaller fish, but um, quite a few fish. And then you can also fish from Lamolo Falls to Tokety Lake. Um, Lamolo Falls has a buried on an adromy. It's um, huge. So um, that's why I kind of separated those two out. This photo here is uh, a photo of a brown trout that was caught um, in that section below Lamolo Reservoir. And the second one is a photo of a nice holding pool, which I cut a couple rainbows out of um, below Lamolo. I wanted to jump in and share about steelhead fishing on the North Umpqua. So gear for summer steelhead fishing. Um, I use a 10 foot, uh, you could use a 10 foot seven weight single handed rod. I prefer an 11 foot uh, seven weight switch rod. That's just my preference. Any spay outfit or single handed outfit that you, you really um, like would, would work well. I would recommend something in the seven weight or bigger. These fish are big and it would stress them out to catch them on anything smaller. So that's what I would recommend. On my 11 weight seven, seven, 11 foot seven weight rod, I use a 550, uh, 25 grain um, line. It's a thinner line than that Skagit line that I recommended. Um, for the single hand long line, I recommend a long belly for a large roll cast and ideal for long loops. Um, I recommend traditional wet flies and skating flies. The North Umpqua is known for skating uh, dry flies across the water and enticing those summer steelhead to come up and attack your fly. They'll explode out of the water to hit it. The picture in the uh, top left there is a picture of a summer steelhead. They get quite, quite big in the North Umpqua. Um, they also, the picture on the right is some traditional flies, wet flies. And then the picture in the bottom there is some, um, some skater flies that, um, that can be utilized for fishing the North Umpqua. Gear for winter steelhead fishing, I would recommend a 13 foot eight weight. Uh, Skagit lines, like I shared with on the Wild Rivers Coast, those, like I said, again, are thicker than the Scandi lines. Um, multiple different tips for the North Umpqua. So I recommended a T11 for um, the Wild Rivers Coast. The 12 foot of T11 will work on the North Umpqua, but I would also recommend having another one that's a little bit deeper, a T14 for deep water situations. Um, this river, the river is so unique has long, deep pools that um, would require you to get a little bit deeper. The structure down bottom is so unique that um, it's hard to get a fly down there at certain times. So really recommend having multiple different tips with you. Um, I recommend large traditional flies and large intruder style flies. Um, again, I was speaking about some of the regulations uh, a little bit earlier in terms of conservation measures that are already put in place, but it's fly only water. The 34 miles below Soda Springs Dam that are wild and scenic um, is de designated for fly only. You can still use a spinning rod with a, uh, a bubble with water and um, um, flies below it, but um, it's recommended for fly fishing only. Um, 
and you can it's generally speaking you're swinging flies up there you're not um dead drifting them or euro nymphing them you're throwing the flies down and across and you're focusing on holding water in which they come up um baker wayside um it's it burned down quite heavily last year during the archie creek fire but the sign's still there and it, um, it shows a lot of the good holding pools that would be ideal to fish. Um, they consider the camp water um, to be everything from around Mott Bridge down to um, just around the corner um, past the Steamboat Inn. Um, and it has over uh, close to 22 different places to fish throughout that two miles or whatever section of their water. Um, it's a great place to just get out there, hike around and learn. Um, learn about that. Again, like I was saying in the previous presentation, for focus uh, when the water is warm and fast, uh, warm water means focus on fast water. Um, when the water is cold, focus on slow water. Those fish are going to hold in those two areas. Wrong way here. Here's some pictures of some beautiful one that summer steelhead. Um, that was caught on the North Umpqua a couple of years ago. Just gorgeous fish, um, beautiful hen. Um, some of the threats to the North Umpqua watershed is warming water temperatures, um, logging, gravel recruitment, non-native species, as well as dams. So these are all things that are, are contributing to um, decreased populations of salmonids and uh, harmful effects to, to the fish. So under the River Democracy Act, there's going to be some awesome things that are going to contribute to the basin. Um, again, the, the North Umpqua watershed is already designated wild and scenic, but there's multiple different tributaries to that basin that are being proposed under the, the River Democracy Act. And although you can't fish those tributaries, it's critical that we protect these long into the future. Um, so the North Umpqua Basin and Steamboat Creek watershed there's been 93 miles proposed up that up there. Um, some of it was included in the Frank and Jeannie Moore Wild Steelhead Sanctuary legislation that passed, um, I think it's two years ago now. Um, other North Umpqua tributaries further up and surrounding that, there's 111 miles that are being proposed in the River Democracy Act. This protects critical spawning and rearing habitat for both wild salmonids and resident trout. So. Um, critical that it be included there. Um, and it protects riparian areas, which are ideal for cold water um, long into the future. As you can see here, these two pictures are post Archie Creek fire last year. It devastated the lower end of the watershed. Um, and it's going to be a long recovery to get back there. Um, some of the logging that I was talking about previously and the threats, um, it is being considered salvage logging um, in these these trees are critical for fish habitat as well as um, long-term structure within the watershed. So um, just something to keep in mind as well. I wanted to finish with just a beautiful picture of the lower end of North Umpqua off of Soda Springs Dam. Um, it's such a gorgeous river. This was prior to the Archie Creek fire. So um, the watershed has changed dramatically and this picture would be drastically different since Archie Creek fire. I wanted to leave everyone tonight with uh, a couple different resources that are ideal for uh, fly fishing throughout Oregon and fly fishing in general. Uh, again, some of the tactics that I shared about tra trout fishing can easily be um, utilized in other watersheds uh, in the Western states or in, and even back East. Um, but some of the resources that I would recommend is the Fly Fisher's Guide to Oregon by John Huber. Um, it has every single, not every single, but a lot of the watersheds in our state that you can fish outlined when there might be hatches, how to fish them, that sort of thing. So it's a great resource. You can pick it up at a local fly shop or on Amazon. The other resource for, for steelhead fishing, I would recommend Steelhead Fly Fishing and Flies by Trey Combs. Um, it was a great, uh, great read. Um, great intel on steelhead waters throughout the entire Pacific Northwest, not just Oregon. Um, and then lastly, I'd recommend you just go and create a relationship with your local fly shop. Those folks know your waters extremely well, um, and they'll be able to point you in the right direction, help you with flies, 
any beginners that are on this presentation today, I strongly recommend you you try it out. It's it's not hard to get into. Folks at the local fly shops um, would gladly help you out, get you set up, um, get you rolling. Again, you don't need a whole lot, a four weight rod, an easy dry line, um, some leaders and some small flies, and just use your shoes and wet weight for a while until you get comfortable doing it. But um, it's an awesome, awesome activity. I'm super passionate about it and I, um, I really enjoyed sharing about it with you today. So um, that wraps up my presentation and I wanna thank you all for joining me. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to Oregon Wild or myself. Um, I can share in the follow-up email um, contact information for me, but um, do not hesitate to reach out to me. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you, Jamie, to, uh, to share about the River Democracy Act. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take two, two minutes or less. That's my pitch. And if you have questions for Kirk, um, put them in the, the chat or the Q&A bubble in Zoom now, because we're gonna go ahead and get to those really soon. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead. Maybe you can stop screen sharing, Kirk, and I can start oh. really briefly. I've got like five slides or less here because um, I wanna get to questions. Thanks for that presentation. I was taking notes and I'm so glad this is recorded um, because I'm gonna need to come back and reference it. <laughs> uh, so River Democracy Act, um, my maybe 60 second pitch to you. I think that Kirk already did an amazing job outlining, you know, what the bill is and the kind of influence it can have, especially within the region that he's super familiar with. Um, this bill is, the most important river protection bill that Oregon has seen in a generation or more. It's amazing. So we're talking about nearly 4,700 miles of rivers and streams and a couple lakes um, spread out all across the state. And this bill was compiled after a two plus year public process where Senator Wyden was out and about um, having, having town halls, meeting with folks um, and taking submissions in person, online and in snail mail. He got over 15,000 nominations for um, segments of rivers and streams to include in this bill. I think if, if I'm going to make one pitch to you or maybe two pitches, big or small, we need them all. Kirk was really hammering this point home and I just want to say it one more time, like these smaller streams, creeks, tributaries are so important. Like if we want a uh, commercial fishery, if we want to have, if we want to have, you know, fish generally at all in any of our larger river systems, we need these smaller tributaries, creeks and streams to be there to provide cold water and all of this super important habitat um, for these fish to spawn and rear. And all along the you know stream banks is also an incredibly important spot for big game birds. I mean, it's something like 80% of wildlife utilize these riparian corridors and are directly connected to them for their well-being. Big thing just happened with this bill. Um, it just had its first hearing in the Senate. So it was introduced in February. We kind of waited and then it just had its first hearing, which is a sign that the bill is moving. You know, the train is leaving the station and it's moving in the general direction of the president's desk. <laughs> it has to make a few stops along the way, but this is really exciting that it's happening. And so my pitch to you regarding this is that right now there is a, a public comment period that's open. Um, so you can actually submit a comment to the Senate uh, committee on energy and natural resources that's considering this bill right now and send them a brief note online saying, um, I support more wild and scenic river protections in Oregon. And you can expand on that or you can keep it short and simple. Um, I actually have a link that we're gonna drop in the chat here. Um, it's a spot that you can go in and just, oh yeah, Ellie, Ellie put it in there for me, thank you. So you can go ahead and go in right after this presentation um, and send a note to them right now, letting them know that you support efforts to protect more of Oregon's waterways. So with that, let's go ahead and go ahead and head to Q&A. There's a lot here, so we're gonna get as much as we can in the next 10, 12 minutes. Um, so thanks again, Kirk, and thanks to all of you for being here and let's go ahead and get to it. All right, let's get started because um, there's a lot of questions. So the first one is, is there a best time of year to fish the forks of the sprague? I generally, I would recommend a little bit later in summer, like July. Um, this summer, it's going to be a little bit low flows, high water temps. So um, right now might be a little bit better, but 
I really enjoy the hopper hatch or grasshoppers, terrestrials. You can use bigger flies. Um, it's exciting to see those fish really come out of the water and hammer them. Um, and it's a lot of dry fly action. So um, both, both uh, whenever the water temperatures get just right and you see those hoppers crawling around on the, the banks, great time. Those fish are going to be opportunistic, looking up and excited to eat. So that's a fun way to get out there. And it's a fun way to, to start fly fishing too, because you can use those larger flies. You're not using a smaller style of fly. Great, thanks. Um, yeah. And then Jamie, this one's probably for you. Um, will the River Democracy Act protect watersheds from the damage from livestock grazing and logging sites? That's a great question. And, and Kurt kind of touched on that already. Uh, given the amount of time we have, I'm gonna give you a short answer, which is basically that it depends. Um, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act does not explicitly prohibit livestock grazing or logging, commercial logging. Um, so what it does mean is that there is going to be, you know, when a river or a stream gets designated, it gets uh, its own management plan. And it, as part of that, it has a specific kind of list of values that it is protected for. And so the agency, the managing agency, like the Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management, as they're going about their daily business doing management activities, um, they have to be very careful to not cause harm to the values that that river or stream is protected for. And so the short answer is not explicitly. Um, this does give the agency an opportunity to kind of review everything that's happening on that landscape and make sure that what's happening there is compatible with the, you know, the special values that that river is protected for. Um, I think in a lot of places, at least in Central Oregon, we see um, a lot of people who aren't necessarily obeying like when you put the cows on, when you take the cows off. Um, so at the very minimum, I would think that it would greatly increase just the regular uh, impact on the landscape by giving the agency an extra kick in the butt to be paying attention to the things that it should already be doing or working with the community members who are using that landscape. Um, but it doesn't explicitly prohibit it. So it's sort of a no and. Um, if, if, that's, if there's a specific landscape or river that you see that impact happening on a lot, I would encourage you to get engaged in the kind of public process when that river management plan, you know, knock on wood that this bill passes. Um, I would encourage people, members of the public to, to get engaged with the agencies when they're writing those river management plans to make sure that they know um, how you feel about it. Great, thanks, Jamie. Uh, moving on to the next question. Um, so this is for you, Kirk. Could you discuss how non-native invasive fish um, predate our native species and what can we do to help? Yeah, so one major way is they eat juveniles on their way out, so they're very aggressive. Um, it looks like in the, in the question box, uh, bass and German brown are in there. They're both very aggressive species, so when those juveniles are out there as fry, um, they'll feed on them quite heavily. Um, they also take up um, ecological space for, for our native species as well. So the best thing that we can do is when you're out there having fun, enjoying fishing, to uh, take them home for dinner, eat them, um, share them with your family and um, share the bounty. So um, that's something that you can do. And um, not only is it fun, but it provides a good meal. Recently, I was out on the uh, sa uh, main stem of the Umpqua River, which further down. And um, I caught quite a few smallmouth bass, brought them home and had fish tacos. So it was a wonderful meal, but um, anything that you like, but um, it's, it's best if you do remove the species and uh, allow those native fish to, to thrive. Yeah, that sounds delicious. Um, do you recommend anywhere in the Portland area to fish? Yeah, so I would recommend, obviously the Deschutes is a, a, a little ways from there, but um, it's a great trout fishery for folks that are just learning how to fish. Um, the Malala River as well is further up. Um, it's on the other side of the Cascades. So I would recommend going up there, um, checking out some of the trout fishing up there. Again, trout fishing is a little bit easier than steelhead fishing. Steelhead fishing is, um, some folks like to say, a fish of a thousand casts. So um, I did want to share a little bit about it with folks tonight, but um, I would recommend both the Deschutes and the Malala. Um, again, I would recommend checking in with a fly shop there in Portland about how to get engaged, how to get out there, what to use. They'll probably pick out a few flies for you to take out into the field. 
um, and uh, get you all set up to get out there. Great. And then is there a good campsite for accessing the upper Sprague um, Tribs? To be honest with you, I haven't camped over there. I stayed with one of our river stewards. So um, when I went over and fished over there, I stayed with them. But there are multiple areas to camp over there by Gearheart Mountain, I believe. So um, check out both maps over there um, as well as I noticed one of the questions for a first first time trip over to the Sprague, what fly shop would I recommend? Um, maybe call that fly shop in Klamath Falls. Um, I don't know the specific name of that fly shop, but there's, I think, two of them over there. So if you give them a shout, ask them what might be most beneficial. They're usually very welcoming and willing to help share some information. All right, I think I have time to squeeze in like a few more questions. Um, let's see. Do you have any experience with Tenkara fly fishing? Um, any thoughts on this style of fishing in Oregon? Um, I have very little experience, um, but it's it seems awesome. I've read an entire book on it. Um, really, for for some of these smaller streams like the the North Fork, South Fork, Sprague, as well as those uh, the Upper North Umpqua, I highly recommend trying it. Um, some of the fish that I've caught up there with my little four weight rod, I would have easily been able to Tinkara with. Um, and it would have been a lot of fun. Super simple fishing. If anyone doesn't know what Tinkara is, you should check it out. Um, basically, you have like a 10 foot line and a um, small little seven foot rod and one fly. And super simple, get out there. And it's all about just being out there and having a good time. So um, check it out if, if, folks with their interest in that. Looks like there's some stuff coming in the chat box as well. All right. We've got pretty much no more minutes. So I have like one more question for you. Um, and then, yeah, please, if you have more questions, um, feel free to email Kirk, like you said, because um, we're not going to be able to get through them all. Um, so what is a lamprey, a sport fish, something to target or just endangered should we avoid? Right now, I believe they're on the state sensitive species list. I don't know for sure, but um, they're not targeted. Um, it's a, um, I can't remember the scientific definition of a lamprey, but we did just do a presentation with KS Wild with a, uh, a lamprey expert. So you should check that out. Um, it's, I, I showed a couple pictures in my presentation. It almost looks like a snake um, and they actually suck on to the watershed or and onto things and kind of hold on and make their way up. They are anadromous. So some of them will go to sea, some of them won't. Um, obviously the ones in the upper Klamath Basin can't make it and can't make it back. Um, but they're really cool fish, um, highly um, forgotten about. Uh, Native Americans used to live and persist off of them. So it was it's such a cool fish to learn more about. And the fellow that did the presentation with KS Wild was actually a, a lamprey expert. Um, he's got his master's in that. And um, he shared so much about how the, the Yurok tribe used to use them traditionally um, and how he studies um, now in, in modern science. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think that's all we have time for as far as questions goes. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in lamprey, please uh, check out the resource that Kirk said. And also Oregon Wild does have a webcast on them July 27th um, and the sign up is in on the website. So make sure to check that out. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you everyone. And uh, again, check out the link to, uh, to speak up for the, the River Democracy Act and uh, provide testimony. Great. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks for attending. Yeah.